Well, welcome to OTXNT. I'm Dr. Andrew Marquez, joined with Dr. Ben Pate. And together we are going to look at biblical issues, life issues, theological issues from the lens of the scripture. Um, Dr. Ben Pate having a PhD in Old Testament. I have a PhD in New Testament, and we try to see everything through the lens of Christ. Uh, today we're going to be looking at a, uh, a sensitive topic for many, but I think it's an important topic and one that the Bible does have something to say about. And so we're going to look at the issue of abortion today, which uh, I know can, can really be an incendiary topic, but we're going to try to do so in a way that is uh, in love, but also grounded in scripture. Uh, and because we have a pretty tough task before us, I think we need to open in prayer. Yep. And so I'm just going to pray uh, a prayer of God's uh, wisdom and then move into the Lord's prayer. So please join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us, that you've given life to this earth, that you've created each and every one of us uh, in your image. And we ask that right now you'd, you'd give uh, uh, Ben and I some uh, wisdom, careful uh, communication that we would say uh, things that are uh, in line with your scripture and we would not deviate from it. I pray for those that are listening to this discussion that they would be open to hearing your word and that we would uh, have a strong sense of uh, your will, Lord, for, uh, for life. Uh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, so um, abortion. I mean, Ben, some people would say that we don't even have a right to talk about this because we're just a couple of guys and maybe we should just stay out of the issue. Well, what do you think? <laughs> uh, obviously, you and I discussing this, um, we have to. So here, here's part of what I think sprung why we think we need to do this. Um, there are a lot of topics that I think we as Christians um, and Americans just don't think through theologically. I think there's a lot of topics that we just, we think about, um, that we discuss, but we don't really give a, 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 ask the question, what is God's perspective on it? And so you'll see people even within the church where there is real ambiguity on what is a biblical perspective on something. And I think so over the next couple of weeks, because I think this conversation of abortion also opens up some more conversations you and I are going to have to have uh, on what is a biblical perspective of family planning, uh, you know, birth control, things like that, that no one ever really just talks about. We just say, okay, this is what it should be. We live in a time where actually the hard part is many of the answers that we have are really through a lens of politics too. Um, right. I only talk about this because, uh, you know, because this is what's in the political discussion right now, as opposed to saying, you know, um, what does God say about this? We say, well, this is my right as an American or anything. And so we're not asking the question, though, but let's go back to what does the scriptures teach for us as a Christian? We're not talking about legislating this, but we're talking about what should a Christian affirm and what should we stand for when it comes to that? Right. And I, and I think, you know, for those that are saying, well, OK, um, there's, there's an increasing uh, viewpoint of unless you are in this uh, particular group, you can't speak to these issues. And of course, uh, as, as pastors, uh, we are called to speak to the issues of the day, to uh, uh, issues of liberty, of um, morality, of ethics, because we're caring for the flock, not, not just uh, guys in the flock, uh, not just girls, um, but the whole flock. And so these issues are uh, incumbent upon us to, to talk about, and the Bible talks about it. And so I always say, don't get upset at me. I'm the messenger, um, but I am called, you know, so help me, Paul says, if I do not preach the gospel and the gospel is related to eternal life and, you know, life is really the, the center point of what we're talking about today uh, with the idea of abortion. So does the Bible say anything on abortion? Um, you know, and, and just one caveat before we go much further, if you're watching this and you uh, have had an abortion or you know someone who's had an abortion, please don't shut this off. We're not doing anything uh, designed to condemn anyone at this time, but what we're trying to do is really think through the Bible and look at what the Bible says. And, um, you know, my hope is that as people look at the Bible, that we would be open to letting the Holy Spirit change our minds on some things. 
Uh, and uh, I think a, a lot of Christians don't know the Bible says some very specific things on the idea of life in the womb. Uh, so I think it might be helpful if we just start with the Old Testament. Uh, ben, you got a, a couple of passage you, passages you want to look at? Yeah, so I, I guess there's there's kind of a couple things we need to set set straight. So at least from the Old Pre Testament perspective, um, when we talk about abortion, th there, there's nothing that comes to mind um, that is a defined as in the same way the way mod how we would modern in a modern context talk about abortion. There's no sort of concept like that in that like you would go somewhere and get an abortion or or first second third trimester kind of abortion so I want to clarify that what are the way that we kind of begin to build what a theology on abortion should be i think is just by looking at the way the bible talks about babies and the way the bible talks about a woman's body uh, and a way the bible talks about um, you know just what's happening in there and I think that's a big piece. So we need to look at that. Uh, we need to look at like, so I guess, the, the, what does the Bible say about what is happening in the womb? Um, that's a big thing. And then I also think we need to see about um, maybe some things that might be related. And we can come back to that one. Another idea is something that's related to the reasons of why you would want an abortion. So I guess two things we need to look at, in my view, is let's look at what does the Bible say about what's happening in the womb? And then another conversation needs to be had is why do people seek abortions and what's behind that? Um, because even as you bring up, as we'll talk about, you know, people that would make a provision for when abortion might be acceptable, we need to deal with, okay, so if somebody says it's acceptable, what are the acceptable reasons or what's the context for why? And I think the Bible even speaks to that too. So um, I would just say that, I mean, obviously we have to deal with some references in the scriptures on, on what's going on in the womb. So if you want, um, I can just kind of throw open a couple things or if, uh, what I'll actually do, if instead of having to do the screen share, let me just read a couple things out. Yeah. And uh, we'll go from there. So one of the first ones I want to go to uh, is um, obviously, let's look at something like Job 31, uh, 15. And it just, you see things like this. Did not the one who made me in the womb also make them? Uh, did not the same God form us both in the womb? So even though this is poetic, um, there is a concept that, that it is God who is the one forming in the womb, right? That we need to recognize that a biblical view talks about that God is actively the one putting together and forming the baby. Um, that also being said is that just to be able to conceive is a biblical view. I mean, the, the idea that God has to be involved in that. So even in throughout Genesis, and I've been teaching on this in, uh, lately, is you, you see that it's God who shuts and closes the womb. And so the fact that even life is permitted in that womb is a blessing from God. God was the one behind it. Um, okay, some big ones that are maybe commonly used, Psalm uh, 139. Uh, and here is what you would see if you want to look over at like 13, 15 through 15. It says, for you, it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous. I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. And so there's another part of this, which is that it was God who places and puts the baby together. I mean, if you ever think about just scientifically too, um, of how a baby comes together in the womb, it's an incredible thing. And I think that's what we see here in this text is once again, it's God who is putting that baby together like a, a piece by piece forming. Um, and then you see that affirmed in the prophets too. Like for instance, uh, Isaiah, let's go to Isaiah 44 um, and just notice what he, how he says and how he talks about this servant here. 44.2, this is the word of the Lord, your maker, the one who formed you from the womb. And so we see that kind of put in there over and over, the one who formed you from the womb. Um, and then lastly, of course, is the Jeremiah passage, Jeremiah chapter one, when he's called out in verse five and four and five, 
the word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. That's a big, big deal too, because what it's saying is that God had a plan for Jeremiah before he even put him together. So that that's a lot that's there, right? That's a lot of in terms of what does the Bible say is that it is God who is active in the forming. God even has plans prior to even putting that baby together of what he wants to do with it. Now, I mean, that's not to say that, that we also see miscarriage and we see things like that take place, but we, but we see that God is the one who is behind this ultimately of allowing a pregnancy to go through. Uh, he's the one forming and putting that baby together. Um, and so we can affirm both that God is over that and he's sovereign over the fact that a pregnancy that goes all the way to the end, start to finish, and then also that we would have uh, that, that even if it didn't make it over, God is sovereign even over that uh, as well. So that's kind of the, the main piece. There's another reference I'll give as we get there, if we want to in a few minutes, is it's one of the passages of the law talking about what happens uh, and how it views the worth of a baby. But that's the first piece I want to throw out there. It's just the idea of God forming and putting together a baby in the womb. Yeah, and I think that's incredible because, uh, again, we, we kind of look at, you know, uh, the world in a uh, almost a deistic idea that God started a clock and, you know, he wound it up and walked away. And so all the creative uh, work that's happening is, is not an active part of God, but this passive uh, outworking of God's initial creative work. But we do see, not often do you see that God is saying, I'm, I'm doing active creation now, but we do see that when he's speaking of uh, babies being uh, conceived and put together in the womb and being born. Yeah. And so I, I think that that changes your viewpoint. Okay. So there's no accidental conception, you know, that no, no child in the womb is conceived on accident. Uh, yeah, we and, talk about that though, all the time, yeah. even in people in the church, that was an oops baby. Right. There's no such thing as an oops baby. It might be an oops to you, but not to God. Right. And, and if that is the idea that even, um, you know, you can extend to the discussion of incest or rape or, or some uh, situation where there's an unwanted child, you know, a, a child who is born after uh, the, the father's uh, taken a surgery on, you know, <laughs> and they're not supposed to have kids. But, uh, you know, this is my favorite mistake, you know, songs and jokes. Um, not to God, not to God. Every, every person, even if you're hearing this and you feel like, you know, I was an accident, I was unwanted, I've always felt unwanted. God wanted you. Uh, God wanted every single conceived child uh, in some way. It's a reflection of his glory. And, uh, and that would apply even to miscarriages and stillborn and, and these, you know, terrible tragedies that exist in our world because in, it, we, we do live in a fallen world. And, but um, when you realize what the Old Testament's saying here, it's not that God just um, created a process by which human conception resulted in a baby. It's that God is actually... Um, at work in new life in creating uh, a, a baby in the womb. I mean, it, that's just, that, that changes your perspective quite a bit, you know, um, in my mind. And so I think that those passages are really incredible. Um, I did want to look at the New Testament uh, because there's not a whole lot of discussion here, but one passage that I think is overlooked that I really like, if you, if you remember, uh, Mary uh, was not supposed to have a baby, <laughs> you know, so uh, Mary is a virgin and she's confronted by the angel and uh, the angel says the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you will conceive and she actually uh, attests and agrees you know her her response let me just get it from Luke chapter one um, uh, she says you know may your word to me be fulfilled she accepts the the blessing that she will bear the Messiah and then she makes a trip to visit her cousin and her cousin Elizabeth is also having a child. They, they wanted a child and had, had some difficulty, but she's going to have a child. And she visits Elizabeth And Luke 141 says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Th this is not a clump of cells. Th this is not a, uh, a lifeless uh, body that, that so, so much later or whatever, I think, you know, I think we're about three months into the, the pregnancy here for Elizabeth, that the baby is recognizing 
the Messiah, Jesus, in another womb and leaping for joy. And so you might look at that and say, okay, well, that's a nice story. We don't believe any of that happened. But the Bible is relaying this as a true historical event that took place. And notice that these blessed women, the mother of John the Baptist, the greatest among men other than Christ himself, recognizes that John is so excited to essentially meet Jesus for the first time that he has an emotional and physical response to being in the presence of Mary and Jesus. Um, that's in the Bible. Uh, and if, uh, if a Mary and Elizabeth are right in their understanding, what they're realizing is that these are people, that, that these are living beings, that the physical living child, John the Baptist, in her womb has joy over the recognition that the physical incarnate person, Jesus, is in the womb of his mother. And I mean, for me, that, that really just blows uh, any argument out of the water that would say that, that there's no life here. And if you're looking at a time frame, again, John's very early, uh, probably the third month or the fourth month. And Mary, to our knowledge, just was told that she will conceive. And so Jesus is likely in the very first trimester here, and yet he's being recognized by John. So uh, there's not a lot there in terms of length, but I think there's a lot there in terms of content that the early church viewed these children in the womb as children nonetheless. And, and Andrew, I'll just say this. I think we need to pay attention as, as um, Christians, because I think every Christian should be a theologian, not in the sense that you go get a PhD, but we should be looking at how the Bible is written and what that's saying about the things that we, uh, that we believe, that we should all take note of how this passage is written. I think there's a very big reason. You have to ask, why is this passage even in the Bible? What difference? You know, what's the significance? I think there's certain things that God has placed in there for us to take notice of these very details to tell us that that's something we should shelve away and say, this should help speak into my view on something like abortion, too. Yeah, and I, just to clarify, uh, sixth month uh, pregnancy for Elizabeth, uh, not the third uh, the Bible actually says six months. <laughs> so I want to clarify. But yes, uh, it's there. It's there. And, and if you've uh, had a, a baby, you know, I mean, how much fun is it when they get old enough to kick and you can talk to your uh, wife and you talk to the baby, you put your hand on your wife's stomach and the baby responds or kicks or starts doing their somersaults. And, uh, and, and there's actually an interaction taking place um, within the womb. And so, you know, these, are, these should Im influence our understanding of, of what is going on and uh, what is the object of an abortion. Uh, it, it is often sold as a lifeless clump of cells or, or something that is, is less than human. But I, I think that if you spend any time thinking about it and you look at the biblical worldview, you realize that this is um, human life. Not human yeah. life potential, but human life. And, so, and, yes. yeah. No, I'm sorry. You keep going, man. I'll chime in in a sec. Well, that. and so I think that'll lead to the Exodus passage uh, as well. But um, yeah. if we're dealing with human life and we're dealing with innocent human life to some degree, you know, as, as we would understand innocence, a, a child who's not yet uh, committed sin, uh, albeit born a son of Adam and, and inheriting some sense of that original sin, um, this is a precious child of God that we're, we're talking about. And uh, so it is one of those things that we really have to wrestle with hard because um, if we get that wrong, then we open up really a very slippery slope as to why uh, abortion might be permitted. If that baby is not a baby, if that's a fetus that's unliving, which the word fetus comes from Latin, meaning a baby in the womb, <laughs> not, not a non-baby. Um, if that's a living person created in the image of God, created actively by God, then we've got we've got to really look at that. Okay. What does the 10 commandments have to say about this? What does the law have to say about this? How does God treat that? Yeah. So you want to, uh, yeah. So here's, what's interesting. You know, you brought up something and I just thought about the context by which the passage that we're going to look at in Exodus shows. So if you go to Exodus 21, um, there is this like little section in here about fights that would break out between individuals and what to do. So like, in 18, it talks about two people that are fighting and one strikes uh, with a stone. If he doesn't die, if he can later walk up, get out and walk later on, then the guy who struck him and, and uh, broke him, essentially, he's not going to be punished. Um, however, he's got to pay for the time 
that the guy was unable to work. He's got to pay for all that, that he, because of that fight and how bad he hurt him. And uh, then it goes on in verse, uh, you know, uh, you'll see in verse 22 in this, notice what happens here though. And even um, like, so in here in 22, it says, when men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, but there is no energy, uh, injury, then the one who hit her must be fined as the woman's husband demands from him. And he must be paid according to a judicial assessment. So the first idea is, okay, if there's a pregnant woman and she is somehow injured and she gives birth, then the guys, whoever hurt her, he's not going to be, uh, he, he's not, he, he's, he's going to have to be fined for what he did. And it's going to be what the husband's going to require. Then there qualifies that beginning in verse 23 through 25. Here's what's qualified in that same conversation. If there is an injury, then you must give, he goes, life for a life. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, foot for a foot, burn for burn, burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. So in that whole context of how a fight is to be uh, with injury, right after that passage about a woman giving birth prematurely, first off, even the fact that she has to give birth prematurely and there's an issue, you're going to have to pay for that. Second off, then it goes, and I think it clarifies, if a life is lost, then a life is demanded for the loss of that life. And I think that, I believe that's including within that, um, even within the passage talking here about this baby, uh, that if there's issues with the baby too, the baby falls underneath that same umbrella of what takes place, whether it would be adults fighting or not. If the baby is injured, then there's going to be injury or payment that's, uh, uh, that's required. If life is lost, then life will be lost as a result of you taking that life. So um, you've looked a little bit of that too. You have anything else you want to say on that? Yeah. I mean, well, that, that's just, uh, again, uh, the old Testament seems to indicate that something's going on. We, we have a life in the womb here. And again, that, that's the, the crucial point. And if that's a child, you know, then, then we're looking at, at Jesus who says, you know, um, one who receives a child in my name, you know, <laughs> Uh, receives me and, and that we have this attitude of embracing the, the little ones, let the little ones come to Christ, that there's this uh, intensive act of love that God has for these little ones and that these babies in the womb qualify. And, uh, and so it, it just, as you start thinking through these things, it, it, it's a big deal, right? Uh, it's a big deal to uh, actively uh, take that life. And um, the, the early church, I think, continued kind of the same view of the Old Testament on this, uh, that we don't have any grounds for uh, abortive practices in the Hebrew canon. It, it's absent, unless you know of something I don't. Uh, and nope. so uh, if that's the case, um, then we're not really, uh, we would need to correct something in the New Testament if the Old Testament was wrong, but there's no need to correct anything in the Old Testament about um, how abortion should be accomplished because the early church did not do abortions. And while the New Testament doesn't specify it, we do have some very early works that I wanted to go to. Um, you may have not have heard of these, uh, depending on where you um, are at in your uh, own tradition, but there's a, a couple of works that are after the end of the New Testament, but they're still in the first century. One is called Didache. It's the teaching of the apostles. Um, it, it may or may not relate directly to the apostles, but it's a very early Christian document. And in the second chapter of Didache, it gives a list of commandments. Uh, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. We go a little further. You shall not forswear yourself. You shall not make a false witness. And, and then we have this uh, passage. You shall not murder a child by abortion, nor kill that which is begotten. And so we have a straight up statement saying you cannot kill a child in the womb and you cannot kill a child out of the womb. And that is because infanticide and abortive uh, practices were fairly commonplace in the Roman empire. And in the Greek empire, they would have a baby that they was born with a defect. Uh, they'd throw that baby on a rock and let it die. Uh, some of the early Christians are, are known for waiting down by the river where they were casting uh, deformed babies or unwanted children into the waters and the Christians were saving them and raising them and adopting them as their own. So the Christian view has always been, how do we take care of God's little ones? Not what's the appropriate time in which we can dispose. And so 
And, and because we, we know this is referring to an abortive birth because it's comparing don't kill one in the womb and don't kill one out of the womb. And the word is the same, it's technon, which is the Greek word for child. So do you shall not kill a child in the womb or out of the womb? Uh, we can go a little bit further um, about the same time period to the epistle of Barnabas, almost constructed in the same way. It looks like this is a tradition that's going around and reviewing how does the law relate in the church. And it says, thou shalt not doubt whether a thing shall be or not be. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. We just talked about that in one of our uh, discussions. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt not murder a child by abortion, nor again shalt thou kill it when it is born. Um, again, these are very early works. This is the second generation of the church. And as they're formulating how life now in a Gentile saved um, church, you know, mostly Gentile now, and interacting with Roman practices and Persian and Greek practices where abortion is regular and infanticide is common, the church cannot go there. In fact, yeah. it's the opposite. We're going to save that life. And so the history of the church, and I think the, the scriptural teaching that's understood up until the establishment of the church has been that we recognize God's creative work and the life that is accomplished in the womb. And uh, just as it's no longer our purview to dispose of life outside of the womb, cannot kill an innocent, innocent person. We cannot kill an innocent within the womb. Um, so I, we can take it to today, unless you wanted to comment on any of that. Um, so, no, I guess, I don't know if you're ready to just yet get to the question of reasons for abortion, right? Because um, you've got, okay, so let's, let's, let me do this. Let's make the leap here. Cause you brought up in church history, people throwing out babies who were deformed or for whatever reasons, economic reasons or anything like that. And so there's another issue I think that's similar because it ties into the reason of something similar to, um, uh, to this concept of just eliminating babies, um, that we need to talk about because, you know, I think there's a very arbitrary concept. I mean, one question that our culture can't answer is when is that line drawn between what makes a baby and not? And, and I think now the national discussion is um, there's really no line. In fact, post-birth is, uh, is even prohibited up to a certain point. Uh, but a biblical view is personhood begins when God has formed that baby. That's already started. You don't grant personhood anything. You're already a, a person according to God. However, um, I think I want to look at the idea of what, what are maybe what's behind an abortion, right? So why why give a, get an abortion? What were people wanting to? Why does the early church have to deal with that? And so obviously, right, we have people who do it because they just unwanted. I mean, one a big problem we have even today, right, is we have people who do it for you know a, a, they gender selection. Right. I want to, I need a male. And if I've got a female, that's not going to help me. I need to have a male heir. So we'll get rid of the female one. We see that even happening today. Um, there's, there's another part of that is an economic part of this too, right? So people will do it because I can't afford to have these many kids. Um, I can't afford to, to be able to feed all this. And so I, I can't do this. I, I, I shouldn't. Um, and so when you begin to go down that road, when you begin to go into why I would even try to be in control of what I have and what I've been given, you lead to a place that kind of becomes very similar to an issue Israel struggled with. Um, and, and what you don't see, as far as I know, and I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't seen any research done on, you know, abortions in, uh, you know, done in Israel. But one thing that we do see that was a constant issue in a, in a luring in of um of the people was this idea and this phrase of something that pops up and you begin to see it uh you'll see it in leviticus you see it talked about uh in deuteronomy and i love the deuteronomy passage because he talks about don't do these things that the other nations do um deuteronomy 18 says the following when you enter the land the lord your god is giving you do not imitate the detestable customs of those nations no one among you is to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire. Now, the more literal phrase is make his son or daughter pass through the fire. Um, and then it lumps this in with divination and sorcery and, and all of those kind of things. And so when you begin to look more into this concept of passing through the fire, oftentimes 
Um, you would look at that and you say, what on earth? Why would these people ever do this? The, the, the literal image is um, the, they would take their children and throw them onto a burning fire pit, so to speak. Um, and, and the gods that were usually associated with Molech, Milcom, uh, but, but pretty much all the gods in those areas had some sort of fiery sacrifice of offering your children up for that. Uh, and, and what was really behind a lot of that is, is uh, the promise of prosperity if I'm willing to do that. The promise of being, if I'm willing to sacrifice my child, I'm given a harvest. I'm given prosperity in the land. And so you understand that for them, what I needed was ease. I needed comfort. I needed to make sure I had land. I had, so I'm willing to dispose of my child if that means the promise is going to be better. So they're looking at it from a, a pleasure standpoint. They're looking at it from an economic standpoint. And if what they're saying is I'm willing to give this up if it means I get this in return. And so even though it's not a complete parallel, uh, I think that should speak into um, what God's view is. God calls it detestable, the idea of being willing to give up my child to sacrifice if it meant that I would have an easier life in the process. Um, in fact, I'll just say this and I'll hand it off to you. When you start looking like I, you're a, a corrective of this too, look at Exodus, uh, look at Exodus and the stories that are taking place in Exodus one about when Pharaoh's trying to oppress the people and notice what God's blessing is amidst the slavery and the oppression. He's giving them babies. Uh, we, we talk about today that we can't handle it at this stage of my life or I'm not ready God's handing out babies to people at some of the most stressful times. You talk about being enslaved to the Egyptians. And so we determine, we want to say, I determine when is the right time or when I, and, and, and that is completely out of our hands. It shouldn't be because otherwise we're falling very dangerously close to where we see the Israelites fall into, who got entangled into that mess right. of offering up their children if it meant ease for them. Well, and I, and I think that that's the, the key that, you know, typically you're going to hear, you know, I think I heard a, a senator, uh, they were saying, you know, you voted for an abortion bill, you know, how, how could you do that? You say you're against abortion. And, and he said, well, I voted for a bill that would limit the current ab abortion law. And it would, it would eliminate certain abortions that are going on now. And so if anything I can do to vote for that will limit abortions, I, I will vote for it with the goal that I would like to, you know, eliminate abortion altogether. But, you know, uh, there's two ways to start on this. And, and one is uh, you usually hear that the reasons uh, that we need to have an open um, mind when it comes to abortion is that uh, someone might have uh, conceived as a result of rape, uh, rape uh, incest, where we have confidence perhaps that there'll be baby uh, birth defects of some kind. Um, you know, I, I remember when we were um, getting our uh, ultrasound uh, for our second and they were asking, do you want to do this test, you know, where we can kind of see where the spinal cord is and, you know, determine whether or not there's a, a chance for a, a birth defect. And I guess my, my, my response at the time was, well, I guess what would our options be if we found that out? Is there any value in knowing early? And, you know, basically it was in, in case you just decided that that's not the kind of child you wanted, you could terminate the pregnancy early. And I said, Ooh. well, we don't need the test. Uh, we don't even need the temptation. <laughs> we'll, we'll take the, the child that God gives us. Um, and so, you know, th those are the things that, that happen. And so we, we start playing essentially God trying to decide, well, will, um, will this child make my life more difficult? Will this child have... Uh, it, we, we look at it in terms of quality of life. Is it the quality of life of the child? Uh, you know, we can make a judgment. Well, that child wouldn't have a very good quality of life. Therefore, uh, we will uh, abort it, uh, terminate the pregnancy. Or the quality of life of the young mother. She's only 16. Her mom had her when she was 16. They're in poverty. You know, what we need to do is give them the best chance to uh, have a, a good and prosperous life, to finish school. And so if we can terminate this pregnancy now, that'll help pull uh, the young person out of poverty. Um, well, we don't know that. At the end of the day, we don't really know that. And like you said, um, God has kind of said, for the purposes of economic prosperity, it's a detestable thing to terminate a child. And I think the other thing that you see in uh, the Bible is that 
God sometimes uses the difficult times and he places responsibility on people to grow them up, you know, to the hardship. We learn uh, suffering and persecution and difficult times make us more like Jesus. And so we sometimes, uh, I think, sell this as, hey, the world knows this is the best solution, but it's counter to the Bible and it's counter to how God often works. Uh, and it also, it, it cheats the church out of an opportunity to step up and minister to people. Yeah. And um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, the Baptist view on this. Because uh, Southern Baptists, uh, if you do any Google searching, searching, you're going to find that the Baptists haven't always been clear on this issue. And that in the 60s, the Southern Baptist Convention was uh, kind of open to the idea of abortion in the case of rape, incest, incest in the uh, life of the mother. Um, you know, there, there was a, a, a bit of a change in the Southern Baptist world in the 70s into the 80s. And I think the leadership was drifting a little more in line with the world's view on these things and population control. That, that's another reason. That's more of a macro reason. There's too many people anyway, right? We need to limit uh, children. Uh, and that might be a, a better discussion on blessings and, and all that for a, a different video. But <clears throat> in 1974, the Baptist had adopted really their first solid uh, resolution on abortion. This is a year after Roe. So um, part of the reason Baptists were mixed on this is there was not any federal law allowing abortion in America. And so a lot of um, groups hadn't uh, put anything in, in stone on the issue because it was hard to imagine that you would have national abortion in America in 1960, uh, 1969, 1971. Uh, and so basically in response to that, the Baptists came down and said, <clears throat> uh, be it resolved that the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in Kansas City, June 12th through the 14th of 1984, encourages all of its institutions, cooperating churches and members to work diligently to provide counseling, housing and adoption placement services for unwed mothers with the specific intent of bringing them into a relationship with Jesus Christ and or a sense of Christian responsibility. Be it further resolved that we deplore the practice of performing abortions as well as dispensing to minors without parental consent or even notification contraceptive medications that have potentially dangerous side effects and deplore also the use of tax funds for such activities. And be it further resolved that we call upon all Southern Baptists to renew their commitment to support and work for legislation and or constitutional amendment, which will prohibit abortion except to save the physical life of the mother. Be it further resolved that we encourage Southern Baptists to inquire whether or not their physicians perform abortions on demand or give referrals for abortions and that we commend those medical professions, uh, profession who abstain from a, performing abortions or making abortion referrals. And be it finally resolved that we urge our agencies and institutions to provide leadership for our cooperating churches and members by preparing literature to take a clear and strong stand against abortion and to inform and motivate our members to action to eliminate abortion on demand. And so, sorry, that's 1984, <clears throat> uh, 11 years after Roe. But uh, that resolution is kind of uh, held until today, and uh, we've seen the Southern Baptist Church really come strong against this. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, we, we were late to the issue. Uh, the group that wasn't late to the issue is the Catholic Church. And they have a, a different stance. If you heard, the, the Baptist view is that there's one case in which we can permit abortion, and that is if the life of the mother is in danger. And um, that's not really clarified how and what that is, but the, the Catholic Church basically says you can't even commit an abortion for that reason. And that might shock some people, but the viewpoint I think is fairly consistent. And that is that there is no grounds ever for the deliberate taking of a human life. And so even if the mother's life is in danger, oftentimes that's not uh, really, um, it's rarely, rarely the case that the life of the child and the life of the mother are completely uh, one must live, one must die kind of scenario. It, it could be that we have to try to deliver early. We might have to do some things. But in the actual situation where a mother's life will be extinguished, if we don't extinguish the baby's life, the Catholic Church position is you have to, um, you just cannot take innocent life. So there's no grounds. The only caveat that I found is from the Ethics Commission of the Catholic Church, which says if the mother is needing treatment for some other illness, perhaps it's cancer and she needs to take chemotherapy, uh, they would permit such a thing to happen for the treatment of the mother that may indirectly result 
in the loss of the child. Uh, but it's not the same thing as saying we're going to actively terminate this pregnancy early because um, we, we see this as a threat to your life. So that's a pretty hard stance. I don't know that many, um, I don't know how many Catholics actually hold that, uh, but that's the teaching of the church. I know the Baptists have created a caveat, but there's a, some danger in creating any caveat because the slippery slope works one way or another. If we'll let it for these reasons, then um, we see health as a reason. Uh, can we move on to women's health as being any grounds for abortion? So I, I am concerned even having any caveat, but um, the truth is if abortions were limited to rape, incest in the life of the mother, we'd have millions of more American citizens today. I mean, I think 60 million children have been aborted and a tiny percentage of that has been related to anything other than an unwanted pregnancy. Yeah. Um, so, well, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> I'll kick it back. You know, I mean, so as I sit here and I think about this stuff, I just, I think that, uh, you know, the, 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 there's two pieces, right? There's, there's obviously, I think the first piece that you and I really need to get straight is I think it's a call for Christians to know what the Bible teaches and build your position on what you believe based on the Bible. Uh, and so because, because this is political now, is yeah. we're all over the place. I, let's, let's not even have the conversation about the way that it's framed today, because today it's a women's health issue no matter what. There's no limits, no limits at all. Um, we can't tell people what to do with their bodies kind of a thing. Bible can tell you what to do with your body, though. And that's something that we need to realize. Now, other people may not want to agree that, but as a Christian, if you fall, if you believe that you're, that you fall under the word of God's authority, um, then the Bible can tell you what to do with your Bible, with your body. I can't tell you what to do, but, but God can. Yeah. And it's going to be through you submitting to his word and reading through what does he tell you to do, but you need to do that. Um, but I do think there's another piece though, too, is so not only when you have this conversation about call to Christians to just know their, their Bible and to live with those convictions, uh, then we need to ask the question, so what do you do culturally? What do I do politically? What do I do as a citizen in this world? Um, I think there's two parts to this. I think we, we should continue to push for life, even, yeah. if, even if it's not politically acceptable. You know, even if, I mean, the very fact that I would hold to be pro-life is almost a despised position. The fact that I hold that view, I don't care um, that I, I, I'm holding what I believe is the biblical view, a conviction that it's not something I've decided because I thought I'd like to just clamp down on women's health, right? I'm trying to say, what, is the, what do I think the Bible is teaching and live in light of that? So there's that, I, we should fight for that. And, and regardless, and I will say this, there are a lot of people that are jaded uh, who have said we have voted for pro-life candidates to what and what do we have to show for it? We've got people who never do anything about it. Nothing ever changes. In fact, it seems like things are getting worse. Uh, I think I think you still need to make life a priority in how you view what we should shoot for. We should shoot to make it to where life is protected. And if it's never going to change, then we need to work on how does the church come about and support any of that life. I do think it's one of the things I love about where we live in Arizona is having organizations like Arizona Baptist Children's Services, right. where we are trying to bring, um, trying to bring a recognition of what is in the womb, how do we support, and if you don't want it, we will help find adoption for you. Uh, and so I think the church needs to step up. We don't need to be pointing the finger. Uh, you know, all the time, but we also need to be saying, well, then let us help you. Let's come alongside you and really do what the church used to do too, which right. is come alongside and say, okay, we'll adopt, we'll take it on, we'll find a way to help because we're not here to just say, you know, don't do anything bad. We're trying to say, don't go do it and let's walk with you through the process. Right. And I, and that's the thing. If, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you're listening to this and you're a Christian, pray about adoption, pray about uh, trying to foster and do things to uh, really show that uh, the Christians mean business, that we not only are saying that we're against taking of life, but we're also in favor of uh, doing what we can to support unwanted children today. Um, and uh, the early church has been doing that. And if you have had an abortion, I would say 
you know, read the New Testament, that, that <laughs> there are those that have committed any range of sins, uh, including murder. And uh, Paul says, uh, some of you once were, you know, but no longer because you're in Christ and there is forgiveness and Christ will forgive you for the terrible sin uh, if you but ask him and uh, repent. And so um, don't despair. Uh, the reality is if you've committed an abortion, I believe the Bible says that you have taken an innocent life and it's a terrible, terrible thing. And uh, you need to confess and repent and give it to Christ and accept his forgiveness. Um, and if you're seeing this and you're considering an abortion, look at those Bible verses. We didn't make these up. God is creating a new life in you right now. And you need to embrace that regardless of how it was conceived, how, how he or she was conceived, that little person. Uh, God is creating a person, and uh, the Bible also says that children are a blessing for the Lord. From the Lord, that uh, there's a blessing there that um, God wants you to uh, embrace and nurture, and perhaps adoption is a is a good opportunity for you. Perhaps not. You know, maybe maybe you need to raise that baby. Uh, but uh, clearly, the Bible says you need to have that baby and um, nurture and do the best you can. Um, and so, do you, do you want to say anything else? Because I, I don't want people to see this and say that we you know, we're, we're just uh, condemning people because that's not what we're trying to do. No, no, we're yeah. not trying to. I mean, I mean, you and I are going to, I think as we progress with these, we're going to all, there's always going to be something that we're going to point out that are going to have us, that people are going to have to, you know, find out what their ish, their view is on it. Or and if they've messed up in these areas, come to a, a realization. I think that's just the nature of going through these discussions um, because I mean, you and I, I don't know, but I mean, I could tell you, I've come a long way in terms of my views too on things um, and gone from kind of the yeah. cultural norm of, you know, you know, maybe, maybe early on, it, you know, it's not or not, you know, and I think that's one of the things that you and I are trying to do here is notice that we're not trying to offer anecdotes. We're not trying to tell you stories that will tug at your heart. I'm just trying to say, let's, let's, let's honestly evaluate this from a biblical perspective. And if there were other things in the text that would say, hey, here's a balancing out. You've seen, you and I do this. We right. go back and forth and try to say, what's the full range here? There is no other, there is no other perspective besides these verses here. I, 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 would, I just don't think you can get there. Uh, right. any, this is, this was where it leads you is this perspective on life here in the text. All right. Well, I, I don't have anything else to say. I, I mean, we, we can talk about, uh, I think we need another part, you know, God's, uh, view of children and, and the blessing and that might tie into uh, the, the verse on, um, taking care of your own family and, uh, the importance of that as a, as a man and a provider and, um, some people might use that as a case. Uh, we, we can get into that. It, it's really, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily relate to the issue because um, take extinguishing life, <laughs> extinguishing life is not the solution uh, to taking care of your family. So, yeah, um, but, but I do think we do the necessarily the conversation next has to be what is a biblical view of family and what's a biblical view of just having children. Because yeah. we live in a culture that does not value children anymore. And it's even in the church. And it's something that we need to discuss because listen to the way that we talk about babies, listen to the way we talk about children and it's, we use it. And I don't think we under, we really understand the messages that we're communicating. And as a church, if we don't get that right. So I do think we need to talk about that it needs to come up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, probably our next video is just a biblical view of, of having babies and what is what does the Bible say about them, and how should the church talk about them as well? So maybe the people who are having babies might be a little bit ticked off, uh, you know, or even people who are Christians who don't have babies might be a little ticked off. But you know, that's fine. We're just trying to have a biblical conversation here. So yeah. All right. Well, you want to close this in the blessing? Let's pray that blessing over those that are listening. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Uh, may the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. All right. God bless you guys. Thank you for watching. You can comment below, uh, email one of us if you want to talk more about this stuff. Um, and um, Andrew, I think you closed it well, is that we're not, we're not trying to, to, to hammer anybody, but we want the Bible to be what sticks at the end. And you have that conversation with the Lord about your viewpoint on this and whether there's been this in your life to get it right with him. Amen. I agree. All right. Thank you. All right. It's been fun. Thanks, man.